Okay, everyone, let's take a look at lecture 8-2, uh, which is the thigh. So when, when you start to learn about the thigh, what I want you to do is to uh, make analogies with the upper limb. So this talk about development of the body and these Hox genes and the programs uh, that segment the body, uh, those, there are similar programs that regulate both the upper and the lower limb. So a lot of these structures look similar uh, if you have that understanding. For instance, the pelvis uh, looks a lot like the scapula and serves some of the same functions as the scapula, uh, but uh, the pelvis in this case is attached firmly to the uh, spinal, to the vertebral column. So you're not gonna get the same mobility as the uh, scapula has. The femur, a lot like the humerus, so we'll go through all of the compartments uh, of the uh, thigh and we'll see that a lot of the um, analogies hold, including the types of muscles that develop, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so an interesting aspect about the thigh uh, in humans is of course our bipedal nature. Our bipedal nature requires that our femur is angled inward so when we're standing upright with our legs extended, our femur is angled inward so that our feet uh, can be stabilized at our center of gravity. So uh, quadrupeds, their feet are very wide, separated from their center of gravity. Uh, so that's why they can't stand on one or even two legs because they are very much less stable. Whereas our bipedal nature with our angled femurs allows us uh, to uh, run upright because as we uh, take that step in our run, we place our foot over our center of gravity. So that allows us much more mobility than the quadrupedal state. Also notice that our um, pelvic bone, our os coxae, uh, are composed from three separate bones that fuse during development. So we have the ilium, ischium, and pubis. Uh, that form the os coccyx bone. <clears throat> Another important um, little side note that I want you to pay attention to, especially in dissection, is the saphenous veins, the cutaneous veins that run through the thigh and the leg. So the, uh, on the uh, coming out of the femoral triangle, we'll have the great or the long saphenous vein, and on the back of the leg, we have the short saphenous vein. So uh, these veins, especially the short saphenous vein, are sometimes used uh, during uh, uh, cardiac bypass surgery. So for instance, say that uh, one of the arteries on the surface of the heart becomes occluded during uh, surgery, uh, a surgeon will excise portions of maybe the small saphenous vein uh, and transplant that portion of the vein to the surface of the heart uh, to bypass the occluded region of the, uh, the artery on the surface of the heart. <clears throat> so in your patients, you may find, uh, especially geriatric patients, you may find vascular anomalies in the legs or circuitous vascular structures and um, that could be the result of uh, surgeries. So uh, now, of course, we always start every region of the body talking about the fascia. So here we, that uh, fascia of the thigh, um, we name it fascia lata. Uh, so um, <clears throat> that's just the, the uh, fascia of the thigh, that's the name designated for the region of the leg uh, that it's on. But there is a portion of this fascia lata on the lateral side of the thigh that thickens. And we call that thickened portion the iliotibial band or the IT band. This IT band is an important part of the uh, attachments of the gluteal and thigh musculature that help to laterally stabilize the knee and the leg to help us with our upright bipedal posture. So the um, tensor fascia lata, which is musculature uh, embedded within the fascia lata, uh, will tense that IT band and keep 
uh, keep the thigh upright and vertical to keep us from toppling over. And that uh, tensor fascia lata muscle, along with uh, uh, the gluteal muscles, innervated by superior gluteal nerve. So we'll talk about uh, the uh, gluteal region um, more in a different lecture, but we have to introduce that small aspect here. So there are additional hip stabilizers, and two of these are deep uh, in the posterior abdominal wall, which uh, we won't see in dissection until after the visceral portion of the abdomen is completed. So these two muscle, muscles are psoas major and iliacus, but we will see these muscles in the medial thigh. They combine their muscle bellies to form a muscle uh, now termed iliopsoas. Uh, so that, uh, those muscles combined help to fixate the hip and maintain stability. <clears throat> so just like in the upper limb, we talked about the compartments of the arm. We're going to talk about the compartments of the thigh. This helps us categorize these muscles into actions and into nerve innervations. So we have an anterior, a medial, and a posterior uh, compartment within the thigh. So first, the anterior compartment, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, quadriceps femoris muscle and its different muscle bellies, its four different muscle bellies. You can see three of them here on this image, all innervated by femoral nerve. Uh, one muscle outside of uh, the quadriceps in this region is sartorius muscle. It is the longest muscle in the body. Named Sartorius uh, for, I believe it's the Latin for tailor, uh, because tailors um, measure this region of the body, or could also be um, the anecdotes are that tailors sit with their legs crossed, uh, and this muscle is the muscle that facilitates uh, some of that movement. But anyway, note how Sartorius muscle is kind of similar to biceps uh, brachii muscle in the arm in that it crosses two joints. It crosses the hip joint and the knee joint. <clears throat> so uh, here we've gone a little bit deeper in the anterior compartment of the thigh. Now we can see the vastus intermedius muscle, the fourth muscle of the quadriceps femoris group. The attachment of quadriceps femoris is on the tibial tuberosity anteriorly. So it also is stretching past that knee joint uh, to attach, and it does so uh, through two different structures, the patellar tendon and the patellar ligament uh, with the kneecap in between them, the patella. So uh, quadriceps femoris, uh, its tendon coming off of it uh, attaches to the loose uh, patellar bone. Uh, so tendons are the name of this connective tissue structure that extends from a muscle to a bone. The name of a connective tissue structure that extends from a bone to a bone is a ligament. So here we see that distinction here. So a lot of people, um, especially talking about the uh, patellar uh, ligament reflex test called the patellar tendon test, uh, so that's not entirely precise uh, in its wording, although uh, you know you could make arguments because it's testing the stretching of the patellar tendon even though you're using a hammer on the patellar ligament. Uh, but at any rate, it's important to understand the distinction in these anatomical terms. So next we're going to talk about the medial compartment of the thigh, and I'm dividing that into two different layers for you, a superficial and a deep layer. All of the muscles in the medial compartment are innervated by obturator nerve. <clears throat> there are two cases where muscles are innervated by more than just obturator nerve, where they have dual innervation because certain parts of the muscles perform certain actions based on the directionality of their fibers. So in the case of the superficial layer, pectineous muscle is innervated by obturator nerve and femoral nerve. In the case of the deep layer, adductor magnus, one of the bulkiest muscles in the body, uh, is innervated by obturator nerve and tibial nerve. So we'll see that as we continue 
uh, through these slides here. So I'm isolating the individual muscles in these next few slides so you can get an idea. And here we can see adductor magnus. And we can see its muscle fibers going in multiple different directions. Some extend down to the adductor tubercle. Some extend uh, horizontally to the sides, uh, the medial uh, sides of the femur to the linea aspera uh, and the medial portion of the femur. So uh, those different portions of adductor uh, magnus are innervated by different nerves. So the, uh, the uh, adductor portion of adductor magnus uh, is innervated by obturator nerve. And the extensor portion of adductor magnus uh, is innervated by tibial nerve. We can also see a passageway here, an imperfection in this tendon of adductor magnus called the adductor hiatus. Uh, so we'll see that the uh, femoral artery and vein travel through uh, that region. So now let's take a look at the posterior compartment of the thigh. So all of these structures are innervated by tibial nerve, which makes sense. So the extensor portion of adductor magnus extends the thigh. All the posterior compartment muscles are also extending the thigh. So it makes sense that that portion of adductor magnus was innervated by tibial nerve along with these other posterior compartment muscles. So one quick caveat to that is that the short head of biceps femoris hiding here behind the long head attaches to the posterior portion of the femur. Uh, so that short head uh, is actually uh, going to be innervated by uh, the common fibular nerve. So tibial nerve and common fibular nerve are branches of sciatic nerve. When sciatic nerve branches, it becomes one of these two nerves, either common fibular or, or tibial nerve. <clears throat> now, there's some other important landmarks that we need to name and be aware of. Uh, the first of these is the uh, pes anserinus in the medial portion of the thigh. So... Pes anserinus gets its name from the goose's foot. So we have three uh, muscles on the medial portion of the thigh that attach to the same uh, tendon uh, at the knee. Uh, so you can see those three components uh, attaching to the same place. So the goose's foot, pes anserinus. So the uh, acronym to remember the muscles that compose pes anserinus are some gorilla's stutter. So that stands for sartorius gracilis and semitendinosus. Some gorillas stutter. ST stutter for semitendinosus. And you have those labeled there. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the femoral triangle, which is uh, deep between the anterior and medial compartments of the thigh. Uh, so the femoral triangle is this region of the thigh uh, bounded by these structures here on this slide and which contains the femoral nerve and the femoral artery vein and of course lymph nodes that uh, travel with those structures. So the femoral nerve located in the femoral triangle uh, also encompassed by a sheath of connective tissue called the femoral sheath you'll find, once you open that sheath, the femoral artery vein and those lymph nodes. The femoral sheath is actually an extension of the transversalis fascia from the abdomen. Uh, so that transversalis fascia opens up inferiorly to follow the, uh, the uh, external iliac uh, branch of the common iliac artery. So to follow that artery into the femoral triangle of the thigh. I mentioned in the last lecture, 8-1, part 3, about the uh, femoral herniation, and so this is uh, reminding you, this is where that femoral herniation can occur, where abdominal contents uh, can uh, travel inferiorly uh, into the femoral triangle and then uh, pierce that transversalis fascia, the femoral sheath, anteriorly. <clears throat> So here we see the um, route by uh, the branching pattern by which the uh, abdominal aorta 
becomes the uh, femoral artery. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, we'll notice this similar pattern that we saw, a similar branching pattern that we saw in the uh, upper limb. So uh, imagine that the external iliac is the axillary artery, which is branching, uh, becoming the brachial artery or the femoral artery here. And that femoral artery branches to give off a deep artery of the thigh. Just like we had a deep brachial artery, we have a deep femoral artery uh, in the leg. Uh, and so we can see in more detail the branching patterns within the thigh. We can see that there are circumflex femoral arteries around the neck of the thigh, just like we had circumflex humeral arteries around the neck of the humerus. Uh, we can see uh, that we have these perforating arteries, perforating the, the uh, muscles and supplying the muscles coming off of the deep uh, femoral artery. And we can see that the femoral artery is going to extend down behind the knee into the popliteal fossa, which we'll talk about next time. <clears throat> so these perforating arteries are going to travel off of the, uh, the uh, deep femoral artery traveling through adductor magnus muscle to supply the posterior compartment of the thigh. As they do this, though, uh, they are piercing that adductor magnus muscle, and with uh, extensive or prolonged uh, contraction of adductor magnus at this location, at the adductor location of adductor magnus, it's going to cause backflow of blood into the femoral artery from the deep femoral branch. And so the posterior compartment is going to get less blood than it needs. Uh, and so this is a, a, a condition to be aware of, uh, especially with individuals with a tighter uh, adductor medial compartment musculature for whatever reason. And one of those reasons might be occupational or uh, sports related. Uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit. So the femoral triangle, this is what that neurovasculature looks like uh, when we get into a dissection. So this is a pretty accurate drawing. You can also see tensor fascia lata here, very well toned in this drawing attached to the IT band. Um, okay, moving on. So um, talking about, uh, so I already mentioned this, the sciatic nerve branching into the uh, tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. So the tibial nerve is the more medial branch in the posterior compartment of the thigh. And the common fibular nerve is the more lateral branch in the posterior compartment of the thigh. So this will become uh, relevant as we get into how these nerves travel through the popliteal fossa and supply the leg and into the foot. Uh, so, but right now, uh, just be aware that this process is happening. So I always get, uh, in the past questions about certain conditions related to the thigh. So one of these is the muscle spasm or the Charlie horse, uh, common in the quadriceps femoris, maybe also the uh, posterior compartment of the thigh, or triceps surrey, uh, which are the uh, calf muscles of the thigh. Uh, so the Charlie horse is really a result of lack of oxygen, lack of blood flow, uh, to a portion of a muscle or to a muscle as a whole. So with this lack of blood flow comes lack of regulation of the ion uh, concentration gradients. And so this can cause uh, spasmodic contraction of these muscles. Also, if a, uh, you have a contusion in a, a muscle that might break or damage the perforating arteries or the vasculature that drain the muscle, then that can result in this imbalance in the ions due to poor blood flow that uh, can lead to a Charlie horse spasm. Also interesting, as muscles are used, the calcium uh, around those muscles builds up, the calcium that's released during contraction. And that calcium uh, can infiltrate the tendinous uh, connective tissue region and cause calcification to occur. So um, in the 
adductor tendons of the thigh, this process of calcification or uh, ossification of the tendons uh, is sometimes referred to as rider's bones because individuals that ride horses or perhaps motorcycles uh, for prolonged periods of time uh, you know, are using their adductor muscles more so. Uh, and so that calcification, ossification is building up, uh, resulting in um, you know, overuse of those muscles, shortening of the tendons, and that ossification process. So these, this can be a painful condition, uh, and this is, might be why John Wayne was grimacing so much whenever he was riding his horse, who knows? Uh, so finally, groin pulls, common in sports events during quick transitions, uh, changes of direction during sprinting, uh, that kind of thing. So this is just a uh, tearing usually of the proximal attachments in the adductor compartment. Uh, so there are some funny videos, of course, if you're into laughing at people in incredible pain in sensitive areas that you can watch on YouTube uh, from sporting events. So, uh, of course, uh, here's an example of a groin pull. So not a pleasant condition. Um, but at any rate, that's all I've got for this lecture. Thanks.